So, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Apache Hive webinar episode two. Uh, it is my great pleasure and, and honor uh, to participate uh, this webinar as a chairperson. So, first, I would like to introduce all the chair and speakers of this episode two. Co-chair uh, is Professor Angela Sison Aguilar from Philippines. Uh, first speaker will be Professor Philip Descamps from France. Uh, next, uh, Professor Chi Li Chen from Taiwan. Then, Dr. George Roji with uh, Gonzalez from Spain. And maybe finally, Dr. Wei Chun Chen from Taiwan as a scheduled. So, will you let me invite co chair Professor Angela Aguilar to give some remarks? Please start. Thank you, Professor Tsumi Osamu. I would like to introduce my the chair of this uh, very important session. And I'd like to thank the organizers also for giving me this opportunity to participate. To introduce the chair of our session, Professor Tsutsumi Osamu is a professor of the Graduate School of International University of Health and Welfare. She, he is the director of the Sano Hospital in Japan, is an auditor and past president of the Japan Society of Gynecologic in obstetric endoscopy and minimally invasive therapy. He was the past president of the Japan Society for Fertilization and Implantation and the past president and past Congress president of the Asia Pacific Association for Gynecologic Endoscopy and a president of the Obstetric and Gynecologic PRP Treatment Study Group. So I'd like to invite and yield the virtual floor to Professor Tsusumi to introduce our first speaker for this evening. Professor. Yeah, uh, thank you for your kind introduction, Professor Angel. I now invite uh, Professor Philip Descamps. Uh, he is a professor at University of Hospital Anger, France, and uh, director of International Relations Committee for CNGOF and Vice President of SCGP, France Society of Pelvic Surgeons, and also FIGO Executive Board members. And he has uh, numerous publications uh, listed here. So will you please start, Professor Phillips? Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a real privilege for me to be here today and uh, to introduce this very important webinar. Um, I put the first slide on. Is it working? Is it okay? You have the slide? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so as I said, it's a real privilege and uh, I'm involved in this HIFU uh, uh, experience since more than two years. And I would like to thank, of course, the the company and uh, we are working very hard to make the promotion of this new technique in France. So as an introduction, uh, it's a very prestigious webinar and a very uh, uh, well-known uh, speakers today. Um, I just would like to say that it's a major uh, evolution for the treatment of myomas and adenomyosis. Uh, okay. Okay, I don't have the next slide. I'm really sorry. Take it easy. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, it's, it's working. So I'm, I'm living in the western part of France in the Loire Valley. And uh, for those of you that who came to France, it's a really beautiful place. So of course, uh, we, we knew, we all knew this evolution of uh, uh, skipping from conventional open surgery to laparoscopy and then to HIFU, which means no surgery at all and no scars. And of course, uh, we were all involved in, in, in laparoscopic uh, procedures, but now it's a very, very new adventure for us. Uh, fibroids, you know that fibroids is a major concern for women. And uh, in France, there's a difference between 
uh, Caucasian women, white women, and Afro-Caribbean women and Asian women. And there are more uh, fibroids among Afro-Caribbean women, which is 10% of the population in Europe. And the estimation is that the fibroids will be symptomatic, which means we'll need a treatment in 33% of the cases, which is, of course, a huge concern for women and for doctors. And it's uh, in worldwide, it's the, the number one indication for hysterectomy in France. Okay, it's a bit slow, but uh, probably the computer or the, the website or anything. Sorry. I'm waiting. I don't know what's happening. Do you hear me here? Yes. Okay, so I'm sorry, it doesn't work. Maybe the, the internet connection. Okay, do, do you hear me? Yes, is it okay for hearing? Yeah. Okay, I'm pressing the buttons and I think it will finally <laughs> work. So uh, the message is, uh, we, we are, uh, you know that there are more than two, 227 IFO centers worldwide and in Europe, in my, my region of the world, there are IFO centers in, in, uh, in Spain, of course, and we'll have the opportunity and the luck to hear Jordi Rodriguez after. Uh, in England, in, in Germany, and we are working very hard now to have the reimbursement in France from the Ministry of Health. And I'm very optimistic that this will, uh, uh, it will be a success. I'm sorry for the slides. Uh, and of course, uh, IFO is a major indication for fibroids and adenomyosis. And uh, it means no scar, it means one day uh, procedure, it means uh, no complications, and uh, it's very important. We all know that there were in 2020, uh, in 2019, the nice recommendations, and there's been a price uh, uh, published in December 2020, which was 4,000 pounds for a procedure. And of course, those recommendations are based on the literature. There is a huge literature analysis, and it's very important um, uh, worldwide to have those recommendations. Maybe the main message today is to say that, uh, I'm so sorry for the slides. Uh, I think the, the internet connection. Uh, the main message is to say that it's a major evolution for women because of uh, uh, the, 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 there are no scars, no complications. And also it can uh, be of importance in the, in the concern of adenomyosis and fibroids. Uh, before an IVF treatment. And it's, it's a real uh, new point to stress on. And the, the following speakers will, will speak about this. And uh, there, the, it's a, a possibility to have an IFO treatment before uh, IVF procedure and before fertility treatments. So this was my lecture. I'm really sorry for the slides and I wish a very good uh, success to this very important webinar and I keep uh, uh, connected for any questions for France and Europe. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for your uh, opening remarks. Uh, it was uh, interesting and instructive, especially for this meeting. So uh, maybe next chair uh, will be yes. Professor. Professor Chirei Cheng. So allow me to introduce okay. Professor Chirei Cheng, mm -hmm. uh, who is very well known in our region and uh, this part of the world. Uh, Professor Chirei is the founder and CEO of the Taipei Fertility Center. He's an honorary professor of the Taipei Medical University and a president of the Taiwan Endometriosis Society. He's a board member of the World Endometriosis Society. And he was the director of the Center for Productive Medicine and Science, Taipei Medical University Hospital in Taiwan, China from 94 to 2019. And he was our president, the Asia Pacific Initiative on Reproduction 2016 to 2018. Professor Chirei, has been an invited speaker in numerous grand conferences around the world with 
uh, over 210 published peer-reviewed papers in our field of reproductive medicine. So I would like to yield the floor to Professor Chiray to give his presentation. Professor, please. Thank you, uh, Angela. And uh, very nice to see you again. And also Professor Osamu Tsutsumi. Today, uh, can I see my, my PowerPoint? Today, I will touch upon the, um, the challenges of uh, the uterine fibroids and adenomyosis, uh, in, especially in, in infertility field. Can I see my slide? Oh, Okay, so can you see? Yes? Can you see my slide? Not yet, sir. So can you okay. Un okay. stop share and then start sharing again your screen? Yeah. Something. Can I? There you go. Perfect. Okay, okay yeah. Yes. So the uh, challenges of uh, uterine uh, fibroid and adenomyosis in fertility uh, management. Can I have the second one? How can I? You can use the small arrow at the bottom to advance there. The uh, fibroid related infertility as following. First, it will increase the uterine contractility and also the impair the blood supply in the endometrium and the myometrium. And also uh, this fibroid will uh, cause uterine cavity distortion and a thicker capsule. And also they can impair the endometrial receptibility and the gene expression. And finally, the hormone of paracrine uh, changes uh, such as cytokine also increase. According to the FIGO uh, lyomyoma subclassification, you can see uh, from zero to eight. So that means some are uh, uh, some mucous myoma, intramural, and two subcellosa. And the degree, uh, it depends on the, how much involved uh, the intramural. So there's one or one and two, the difference. And there are some uh, systemic review of the uh, uh, uterine fibroid for all locations of the uterine fibroid, no doubt that will decrease. You can see the relative risk is much less uh, in the clinical pregnancy rate, implantation rate, and ongoing life birth rate. So or a compromise in patients with all location myoma. And at the same time, you see the spontaneous miscarriage rate also increase. However, when the myoma is located in the submucous area, you even see the worsen uh, uh, in patient to, in, in respect to the pregnancy implantation and ongoing pregnancy rate. So the relative, relative risk of even uh, higher in those patients. So how to manage, how the strategy to manage this uh, uterine fibroid, I think we can use different approaches such as uterine up, uh, artery embolization or through vagina or through catheterization. Or you, you, use, uh, you can, we can use hysterectomy by laparoscopic approaches or hysteroscopic approaches. Or you can, we can use uh, MR guide, uh, uh, focus uh, uterine surgery or HIFU uh, forever. And for the intramural uh, myoma, type three, four, five, and six, if the size is less than three centimeters in diameter, we can uh, wait. So such as expectant management, if the size of uterine fibro is greater than three centimeters in di diameter, we can uh, use the medical treatment up to three to six months. Uh, this is to try to uh, decrease the myoma size and induce migration of the myoma as far as possible away from endometrium. 
So uh, you can, uh, so if the size diminished, we can uh, do the natural conception or IVF. However, if no reduction, then the surgery is recommended. Then then we'll look at our hospital in a couple of years, we collect about 224 patients doing the history of fibroscope. We can see about 132 patients, which is 58% with abnormal uterine cavity, with some abnormal pathology, okay? So, and then we further analysis this 132 patients, and then they, uh, some are polyps, uterine synechia, septal uterus, but about around 9% are due to some mucus, some mucosa myoma. However, uh, after treatment, you can achieve about 33% pregnancy rate. Then I will share one case is this is some mucosa myoma type one, that means majority is location in the uterine cavity, 35 years old, secondary infertility, and with some mucosa myoma. So you can see here the size, okay, the size of uterine uh, some mucosa myoma around two centimeters. So you can see the big some mucosa myoma. So we can use uh, the hysteroscope to remove this uh, some mucosa myoma. And then two months after, uh, one month after second look, you can see still there's some residual, okay? Residual intramural uh, uh, during the second look uh, laparoscopic uh, examination. So again, I remove this one, uh, it is uh, one month later. And then after the third look, almost gone, you see, and my, this, some, the, some mucosa myoma turned out to be intramural. So, so almost cream, almost cream in the uterine uh, cavity. Again, uh, about uh, three months later, the patient received uh, re receive the intrauterine insemination with chromid and uh, gonadotrophin dual trigger. And finally by IUI in, or AIH, she had a baby no need for uh, IVF. The other case is multiple some mucous myoma, you can see here. So still two stage approaches. The first one, they move the majority of the fibroid. And then the second look, still two small uh, some mucous myoma remain. Uh, again, you can see the tortures, the uh, blood vessel uh, on the surface of the myoma. So you can see why the patient are uh, easy to get breathing. Again, the second look and remove it. So finally almost clean and the patient have two pregnancies uh, and have two babies. And this is more complicated. You can see the tortuous, uh, vigorous uh, vessels, continuous breathing. Uh, and this size around three centimeters uh, during the lapara uh, scopic uh, examination. So again, I did the uh, remove this uh, some mucus my, my laparoscopic approach. So you can see here, just use electro cautery. This is a uh, flexible laparoscopic uh, removal of the, so you can cut the majority of the some mucus myoma and the remain small portion of the myoma in the uh, intramural uh, portion. Quite big, yeah. I'm sorry, hey, well, what's happened? Uh, wait, 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 wait. Can I, can, I cannot see. Sorry. <laughs> okay. 
So the, the second look, you can see almost all the blood vessels are shrink. And then uh, because the, we uh, disconnect the blood supply, they turn out to be smaller and with pale and in appearance. And then you can remove easily for the second look. And after uh, two or three months, you see almost cream. And the um, uh, some mucosal some um, uh, subside. And again, uh, for those patients with uh, intramural myeloma, you, this is another second case. Uh, this is uh, in the 33 years old uh, women, and she had a spontaneous pregnancy three months after myomectomy. So you can see this is a big three centimeter by seven centimeter in size. So uh, multiple myoma, and then we can do a myomectomy and she conceived spontaneous three months after the surgery. So this is another uh, intramural myoma, a 30 years old lady, primary for three years, multiple intramural myoma, and she failed IVF once. And again, you can see, this is a big uh, uh, anterior myoma, posterior, and also this inside this fibroid, there are some cystic degeneration. So you can see after remove, you can open the mouth like cystic degeneration here. And after the surgery, uh, she, uh, I think the surgery is in, in, in I think is in February, okay? So uh, four months later, she conceived. We can see last, last week, she came back with early gestational, uh, gestational sac uh, in the ultrasound uh, examination. So the management strategy for uterine fibroid, we, are, we have surgical, surgical approaches or non-surgical alternatives, such as uterine artery embolization or HIFU or MAC, uh, MR guide uh, for gas surgery. And also we have different uh, um, management by medical uh, treatment. Uh, you can use uh, transamine uh, or IOD uh, projecting coated IUD or selective projection uh, receptor modulator, IU486 or GNH agonist antagonist. The majority of the advantages try to reduce heavy menstrual breathing or shrink the fibroid or, the, or, kill, or uh, correct the anemia. But still, there are some disadvantages. For example, when you use the projection uh, receptor modulator, Sometimes, according to the Jack Donnay's uh, publication, associated with some endometrial changes, so-called PACS. So still it's very cautious. And also when you use the agonist or antagonist, still the patient can develop the bone marrow uh, density loss. So, uh, and again, now uh, they have some oral GNS antagonists available now. But, uh, be aware uh, in the recent publication from New England Journal of Medicine, when you, we do the uterine artery embolization versus myomectomy, again, the myomectomy had a better fibroid related quality of life. So you can see here, this myomectomy, this uterine artery embolization, and this is uh, uh, the quality of life measurement, the questionnaire after two years, the higher the better quality of life. So again, you can see patient received myomectomy, the satisfaction rate is much better, is better than uh, artery, uh, uterine artery embolization. Now I will switch to the uh, adenomyosis and the ART. Uh, you can see here in patient uh, with adenomyosis, this is the foci uh, in the, uh, the tissue, you can see there are longevity, 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 longevity genes highly expressed, of which is 62. So this is why patients with the adenomas are not easy to be cured because the gene, they can survive longer. And then what is the uh, mechanism that impair the fertility potential in patients with adenomas? Because, because local hyper the increased estrogen, and this is increased uh, estrogen can increase the peristalsis of the adenomyosis. 
and also induction of the tissue injury and the repair, so-called TIAR in the junction zone. And this, uh, at the same time, uh, the adenomas is also, uh, they can down regulation of those implantation genes such as Fox, FOXO1A or HASA10 integrin, as well as the leaf uh, uh, protein. And besides, they also increase the, uh, the macrophage MCP1 natural killer cell and the CD60. All these will impair the implantation. And then uh, we try to examine our patient. You can see here, this is the endometrial gland with hemorrhagic opening. You can see during the uh, hysteroscope, you can see the hemorrhage spot opening on the surface of the endometrium of adenomyosis. This is why those patients are not easy to get pregnant. This continuous breathing and breathing. So the embryo is not easy to implant. So you have to cure this uh, pathology. And the image studying of adenomyosis, as you know, the MR I is much better than tra traditional vagina ultrasound because the area under curve is 0 0.9 in MRI compared with the 0 0.8 in transvaginal ultrasound. So the correct diagnosis was easy to obtain and more often uh, with MRI. So you can see the MRI is very easy to appreciate this widespread uh, thickening of the junction zone with uh, uh, numerous high signal foci and a loss of the definition in the endometrial margin. So it's more easy to, to be diagnosed by MRI rather than uh, transvaginal ultrasound. And there are numerous uh, publications try to explain, especially for patients with uh, IVF in patients with adenomyosis, they are decreased the ongoing pregnancy rate. So you can see here, there are three publications and this uh, uh, blue bar is adenomyosis. Okay, so equally, the pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy rate is suppressed compared with control. See, see the control with much higher pregnancy rate compared with adenomyosis. So uh, we have must do something for those patients. However, when patients receive uh, down regulation uh, with GNRH or so-called pretreatment with prolonged uh, GNRH treatment in these two publications, you can see the pregnancy rate is almost, almost identical with the control group. So that's very obvious and clear. GNRH pretreatment may do some beneficial effect to those patients with adenomyosis for IVF. So we have one patient, uh, she's 40 years old, secondary infertility for 10 years. She had anemia because the big uh, adenomyosis and a severe with uh, antiphospholipid syndrome because a, ban a bunch of antibodies and she her uh, CA125 is very high, about 576. However, she reduced the CA125 level to 34 after two months of the GNR uh, pretreatment. So you can see here, this is before GNR, the size is very big. You can see the, the size of uterus is 9.9, .9, very big. However, after two, two months treatment, reduced the size to seven by six. So you can see the tremendous effect of GNRH. And then uh, we have some pilot study. We collect 10 patients. Okay, 10 patients age range from 39 to 40. And you can see the CA, uh, CA125 level before GNRH very high, 100, 200. After GNRH return, almost return normal range. You can see about 31, 20 again. And in addition, when you look at the uh, uterine size, before GNRH is very big, and after GNRH, they reduce 63%, 29%, 70%. So you can see the 
tremendous reduction of the uh, uterine size after GNH, uh, one or two months treatment, and four of them get pregnant, conceived. Then we do the uh, following study. We collect uh, 36 uh, patients, uh, received long uh, treatment. That means uh, one or two months uh, GNH, the other seven with antagonist treatment. The only difference is the outcome. You can see for long group, you can see the green curve pregnancy about 37, uh, 36% but implantation and ongoing pregnancy and also ongoing pregnancy rate of seven, uh, 28%. When you look at the antagonist group, almost zero pregnancies. And then because I think age is very essential uh, contributing factors to pregnancy rate. So again, we look, divide those 36 patients, two group, age under 38 and age over 38. So with 16 is the younger patient, 20 is a little bit old patient. The only difference is pregnancy rate. You can see uh, when younger patient, you can have clinical pregnancy of five, six percent, implantation twenty-five, ongoing pregnancy fifty percent, compared with the uh, uh, age over uh, thirty-eight. So age is important uh, uh, for adenomyosis. And what is the uh, potential mechanism of the direct effect of GnRH on adenomyosis? Five reason five uh, number one is the GnH they can reduce tumor size by down regulation of the TJ beta also they inhibit inflammation by diminished IL-1 and the induction of the apoptosis by suppression of the uh, BCL2 or increase the VAX gene and the number four is the oxidative stress when they receive the GnH treatment Oxidative stress much less because the NO uh, also diminished. The finally, uh, the angiogenesis also diminished because the, all the VGF are totally suppressed by this uh, treatment. And again, a couple of years ago, we published a paper in fertility sterility for those patients with uterine glioma, also the GNH agonist prolonged treatment also they can suppress uh, all those genes such as mark kinase, uh, VGF, or uh, uh, some inflammatory uh, gene, proliferative gene, et cetera. So the mechanism of the GNRs for the uterine lyoma, lyoma is very similar to adenomyosis. And then uh, you can appreciate, see the, uh, for long-term uh, pituitary uh, down regulation before the frozen embryo transfer, well, IVF also could improve the pregnancy outcome in women with adenomyosis. So you can see down regulation first, and then frozen embryo transfer, you can receive, you can appreciate the preg implantation rate is much better than uh, control. Clinical pregnancy 51, 22 for control, and ongoing also about uh, 49%. So down regulation, very, very important. And again, some meta-analysis, you can see uh, a lot of uh, uh, publications showing the clinical pregnancy rate is much, much compromised in adenomyosis compared with uh, control. You can see the uh, clinical pregnancy only 0 0.2. And uh, besides, they increase the miscarriage rate. You can see here, in patients with adenomyosis, the miscarriage rate is around two times higher. You can see two times higher in patients with adenomyosis compared with the, the control. So uh, again, for those patients, if the CA125 is big and it is high and big adenomyosis, sometimes radical resection of adenomyoma tissue is, is necessary. And Dr. Osuda, they already develop a so-called tri uh, triple FREP methods. The first one is cut the uh, uterus, uh, entering the uterine cavity, and remove the both sides of the tissue, and carefully meticulously repair the endometrium, and then uh, triple FREP method to repair the 
the the uterine uh, the uterine uh, myometrium. And most important is after the surgery. See, we we are usually do a second look uh, lab uh, hysteroscopy. You can see still some residual arterial mouse is here. So you still need uh, some surgery or need a GNR uh, following treatment to remove. And then the patient can have the pregnancies. And so that is the uh, successful pregnancy after conservative surgery for uh, morbid or malignant adenomyosis. So you can see the after the surgery, there are variable a pregnancy outcome from 16% to 6%. But however, there's a large group from Japan, you can see 100, 100 patient and pregnancy rate can reaching 41% if age under 40 still, age is very important. However, only 3% if age over 40. So again, you can see uh, the, the importance of the age and the, uh, and the probably size and the pretreatment or not, with GNRH or not. So for those patients with poor responder, sometimes we consider this tongue regulation, the side effect. So again, uh, we can use the uh, segmental IV approach or adenomyomectomy. So it depends on uh, the patient's situation, depend on whether the patient is normal responder or poor responder. So that's the final diagram for IVF in adenomyosis. If the patient or patient should receive GNR's tongue regulation, if the GNRs return to normal, they can we can do IVF for outside retrieval and do embryo transfer fresh. However, for severe and adenomyosis, for poor responders, then we choose segmental IVF. Well, that means we do the ovarian stimulation and the egg retrieval first, and then tongue regulation of the patient with the GNR until the, the GCA 125 less than 35 then we do frozen embryo transfer. However, if the CA 120 is still big and the size is still more than 10 centimeters, then we, in between, we select adenomyomectomy. And then, and then a tongue regulation and the frozen embryo transfer. Okay, so that's my last slide. I was thank my collaboration across the Taiwan, the whole island. Uh, with my previous uh, physician resistant fellow and my lab and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Chiray, for an excellent lecture as usual. So we'd like to uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, please type your questions in the chat box. And let me fire the first question, Professor Chiray. You've discussed hysteroscopy uh, prior to uh, natural conception, uh, AI, or even uh, frozen embryo transfer. How do you prevent intrauterine adhesions uh, from occurring after a hysteroscopic procedure? Uh, <clears throat> usually, uh, for because only 10% of the infertile patients have some pathology, so 90% 90, 90 is normal. So usually, I do routine. Uh, Office, okay, office is just go with three milli, uh, mini, uh, millimeters uh, fiberscope to see, to see without anesthesia. So three minutes, you can examine the whole uh, cavity. So 90% will be okay, but 10% with some uterine um, pathology. So uh, usually we, we need to uh, do the uh, septum uh, resection or polyp removal or some microsome myoma. Uh, uh, removal. You, you can use the you know yellow barrier on you know, the gel to prevent uh, 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 adhesion. But the most important is technique. Uh, you, if you're meticulous, uh, careful technique, uh, usually there's no uh, adhesion. Just I show you in my 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 slide. Usually no. But if you are very concerned for adhesion, you can use the gel yellow barrier to to prevent adhesion. Okay, thank you. We have a question here from Mr. Qatar Iraqi Husseini. What is the posology of GNRH? Uh, I presume he was referring to uh, how much would you give uh, for 
a segmented IVF or uh, in contrast or an ultra long protocol that will allow you to improve your pregnancy rate? Very good questions. Okay. Normally the patient receive two months, that's more than enough, because after two, even the patient CA125 is very big, more than 200, 300, after two shots, two months, usually you can see the down regulation of CA125 less than 35. So there are two criteria. One, if the patient, the, the uh, uterine size reduced to, uh, to, to uh, 30 to 40, uh, 60%, then you can perceive IVF or the CA125 can uh, come down, goes down to 35, you can go for IVF. If the patient, the uterine size, the adenoma is still very big, more than 10 centimeter in diameter, second, CA125 cannot go down to 35, then we consider adenoma mectomy. So adenoma mectomy usually is the last option. The first option is try to medical treatment, GNRH pretreatment, and 90% of patients, no more than two months, yeah, believe me, they will shrink. And you see the size, uh, shrink about 60%, so easy to, to, to do the IVF or, or use IUI or do the natural conception. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what about, uh, when do you start HRT for segmental IV IVF? After two months, we don't wait for period because the period does not arrive after two months of GNRH. Yes, yes. Uh, after two months, you see uh, normal CA125, the uterine size shrink to about six centimeter in diameter. Then you can apply the uh, HRT or H34, and then uh, usually the pregnancy rate is very high. That's good. So we have another question from uh, Olaric. Hello, Olaric. Do we need GNRH agonist after adenomyomectomy? Uh, will that be, Olaric, will that be a... Uh, Please, yes. Agonist uh, for IVF or for segmental? How would that be? Okay. After adenomal, um, adenomal me usually I do routine hysteroscope to see if there's any adhesion or because sometimes you go into the uterine cavity. So you can create some adhesion or some residual. You know, I just see there are some endometrial adenomal openings in the endometrium. So the Subsequently, GNRH for about one or two months is necessary for adenoma metonic. The second reason, uh, opinion, uh, reason is usually after three months, the uterine enough time to heal. So please do not, please wait until three months after surgery to any kind of IUI or to embryo transfer, etc. Three months is, is very important. Okay, thank you very much. That was extensively discussed and we've had a very fruitful uh, Q&A. So thank you, Professor Chiri, and we'd like to move on. I'd like to call uh, our chair of the session, uh, Professor, to please introduce our next speaker. So uh, before his uh, talk, I would like to introduce briefly uh, Dr. Jordi Gondai. Uh, since 2007 and currently, membership of the Functional Gynecologic Oncology Unit and member of the HIFE Unit at the New Tua Terrassa University Hospital, Spain. And 12 years of experience in the treatment of uterine hybrid and other benign pathologies with ultrasound guided hive. More than 850 procedures done between 2008 and 2020. Since October 2019, membership of the ESG Working Group on Non Surgical Ablative Therapy on Benign Uterine Disease. Uh, speak at various courses and uh, congress in gynecological endoscopic surgery and uh, ultrasound therapy, both national and international, with the publication of uh, some articles. 
So please start uh, talk. Uh, topic will be hive and fertility. Dr. Jordi, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please start okay. your talk. Okay, I have uh, some problems to, to share my presentation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, sorry. I don't know why I cannot to share my presentation in this moment. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. I think it's going to... Okay. Perfect, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for your kind invitation to this webinar to speak about HIFU and, and fertility. Uh, okay, the first thing I want to point out about the uterine fibroids, uh, apart from the fact that they are very prevalent and cause significant morbidity in women, is that there is enough evidence about their negative impact on fertility. And this infertility associated with fibroids occurs by different mechanisms that have been described by some authors, such as anatomic distortion of the uterine cavity and an increased uterine contractility, impairment of the endometrial and myometrial blood supply, and hormonal changes um, induced by fibroids, which could impair gamete transport. Okay, but on the other hand, we must also take into account the age factor, because as you know, the age remains the single most important determinant of human fertility. Modern societies have changed rapidly and currently there is a tendency to delay childbearing beyond the age of 32 years, mainly in Western countries. And this situation combined, combined with the increase of fibroids with age, leads us to a new scenario, which is the large number of older patients with fibroids and problems conceiving. And the advances in new reproductive technologies cannot compensate for this issue. This is a serious problem. Uh, the effect on fertility impairment depends on the location of the fibroid. This is clear. There is evidence that patients with submucosal myomas and intramural myomas distorting the uterine cavity have the most important the most significant impact. On the other hand, some authors support the idea that intramural fibroids greater than four centimeters, even without cavity distortion, may also negatively influence fertility. In fact, there are many studies focused on association between this type of fibroid and in vitro fertilization outcomes. In this line, some publications like, like this systematic review or meta-analysis conclude that this type of fibroids even small size over two centimeters really impact adversely on if outcomes. However, it also concludes that there is still no definite evidence to indicate routine myomectomy in these cases. We strongly believe that high food therapy, but it's not, it's not invasive nature, could be a good treatment option for these patients. But okay, it's something that we have yet to demonstrate with some prospective randomized studies. On the other hand, women, when women get pregnant despite the uterine fibroid, they are subject to specific pregnancy complications such as premature delivery, placental abruption, placenta previa, and abnormal fetal position, and another, another complications. 
In terms of treatment, there is currently a large arsenal of available treatments from classic excisional procedures to occlusive procedures, and of course, abrasive procedures such as radiofrequency ablation and high intensity focused ultrasound. Even though so much variety of treatments, nowadays, nowadays myomectomy is still considered the gold standard for women with symptomatic fibroids who wish to become pregnant. Surgery to remove fibroids seems to improve fertility, especially in some mucosal fibroids. Anyway, if you look at the literature, one wonders if that is really true. This is Cochrane Review of 2020. Uh, that concludes that there is no evidence for a significant effect on the clinical pregnancy rate after myomectomy of an intramural or, or submucosal fibroid. This is not my opinion, it's published evidence. Nevertheless, there's enough evidence about complications associated with, with myomectomy, with myomectomy. Uh, hemorrhage, hemorrhage and blood transfusion, organ injury, it can cause pelvic additions that may increase the risk of infertility and cause a uterine scar, uh, delaying the time of gestation and increasing the risk of uterine rupture. Okay, what can HIFU offer to these patients? Surely many of you already know that HIFU is an emerging and not invasive technique for the conservative treatment of solid tumors. In 2002, Professor Wang reported the, that ultrasound guide HIFU was safe and effective in treating uterine fibroids. In uh, 2004, FDA approved uh, HIFU for the treatment of uter uterine fibroids. In 2019, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence approved HIFU technique and published a medical guidance on ultrasound guide HIFU with evidence-based recommendations. In the same year, the SG Working Group on Non-Surgical Ablative Therapy of Benign Uterine Disease was created, of which our HIFU unit play an active role. Okay, according to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, right now over, over 128,000 women with uterine fibroids have been treated throughout the world with great success. Okay, in respect of the therapeutic principles, the ultrasound waves are delivered by trans therapeutic transducer and they travel safely through adjacent tissues to reach deep into the focal spot. Suddenly, a small area of selected tissue is heated between 70 to 90 degrees and is destroyed. Focal spot is guided, is guided by real-time ultrasound imaging The safety of the treatment is based on its great precision to treat, to treat tumors. This is supported by several studies of pathological anatomy that demonstrate a cognitive necrosis with clear and sharp boundary between treated region and non-treated region. Okay, and this is the result of, of HIFU treatment. On the left, you can see the images before sonication and on the right are images after treatment that show uh, hyperechogenic changes at the top and, uh, and a non-perfuse volume of 100%, sorry, of 100% um, on contrast enhanced ultrasound and on contrast enhanced MRI. In relation to fertility, HIFU safely and, effect and, and effectively achieves ablation of uterine fibroids without damaging the surrounding myometrium, which conserves its biomechanical properties of tension and contractility. HIFU also preserves ovarian and endometrial function. We have some studies that show no significant difference between the antimulian hormone levels before and after treatment with no amenorrheic patients after the procedure and with yeah. no symptoms okay. suggested of menopause after treatment. In this other prospective study from the last year, Melkozerova et al. observed no significant changes in molecular and tissue markers of endometrial receptivity in women undergoing high fibrillation for, for, for uterine fibroids. 
The objectives of HIFU ablation of uterine fibroids in women with gestational desire are on the one hand to achieve the inactivation of the hormonal and vascular function of fibroids. On the other hand, to shrink them in order to normalize the uterine anatomy. Both things seek to increase the chances of obtaining a safe pregnancy without complications of, of the surgery. Well, we already have several publications with good pregnancy outcomes after high food treatment, large, large series of 80, 100 and up to 130 pregnancies after high food with high gestation rates. The conclusions of all the authors are the same. Full term pregnancies with a normal delivery and without complications are possible, possible after high food and there are no rare cases of uterine rupture or abnormal placentation. Okay, I'm going briefly to talk about our experience with the HIFU technique and the pregnancy outcomes. And I take this opportunity to congratulate my team at the Mutua Terraza HIFU unit in Barcelona for their recent publication of our work. In our retrospective study, we include 560 women with symptomatic uterine fibroids who underwent ultrasound guide HIFU between February 2008 on February 2018, 71 pregnancies in, of 55 patients have been obtained, which is to our knowledge the longest series of pregnancies after high food treatment in a Western country. The pregnancy rate was 34%, which is similar to or better than after laparoscopic or laparotomy myomectomy, and higher or lower than that after hysteroscopic myomectomy, depending on, on the study. Among the 71 pregnancies, there were 43 deliveries, including a natural twin gestation, 22 first trimester spontaneous abortions, and six therapeutic abortions for personal reasons. As you can see in this table, the incidence of cesarean section uh, was uh, low. It was 43%, which was much lower than in patients undergoing myomectomy or uterine artery embolization or in those reported by other authors after ultrasound guide HIFU. Regarding the characteristics of 43 successful deliveries achieved after HIFU, the rate of full-term deliveries was 91%. Therefore, the rate of pretend delivery was 9%, only four cases, which is lower than in the series of pregnancies with untreated fibroids or pregnancies following UAE. The mean birth weight of the 44 newborns was three kilograms. Seven of them were low birth weight infants, these that you can see here, except for the 1.4 kilogram baby who was born with a previously diagnosed tetralogy of fallot and intrauterine growth restriction. The remaining newborns, 98%, developed well without complications during postpartum and breastfeeding. The complications detected during pregnancy were one case of first trimester bleeding, one preterm labor, one renal colic caused, caused by growth of the myoma, two cases of placenta previa, and two cases of preterm premature rupture of membranes. The intrapartum and postpartum complications reported include three retained placenta uh, with, manual, with manual removal, one of which received uh, red blood cell transfusion, one case of severe preeclampsia that ended in forceps assisted by delivery at 33, thir sorry, at uh, 37 weeks, and two cases of emergency cesarean section for fetal bradycardia and for hemorrhage associated with placenta previa. It should be known that this series had no cases of uterine raptor or placenta accreta, which can occur after myomectomy or UI, UAE. Regarding the clinical outcomes of the treatment in the 55 women who became pregnant, hypoablation was followed by substantial shrinkage of the ablated fibroids with significant symptom improvement. We must highlight that these results were achieved in women with a medium maximum diameter of treated fibroids of 6.4 centimeter and a non-perfuse volume ratio of 76%, which is higher than that reported in most series of high food treatment. 
only five minor complications were observed. This in one patient, the 10 centimeter fiber treated was almost completely expelled from the vagina six months after high for ablation. Another patient had vaginal discharge of the treated fibroid two months after, after HIFU. One patient had first degree skin burn and two patients had self-limited hematuria. No major complications such as bowel or bladder injury or nerve damage occur, occurred and no patients developed amenorrhea after high ablation. Then I'm going to present some interesting cases. This is a 30-year-old woman with a previous premature labor with hypermenorrhea and anemia, severe anemia, and secondary sterility. As you can see, she had a transmural fibroid of 10 centimeter. It is high point tense, very good case, and has low vascularization. This is a very big fibroid, but with two good characteristics for the, to respond to, to HIFO. Okay, we achieve a complete ablation. You can see 100% ablated. And this is image, you can see the great number of his volume. MRI six months later showed a reduction in the size of the fibroid to two centimeters. Just then, the patient underwent a hysteroscopic resection of the remaining myoma fragment. And this is the hysteroscopic video after HIFO and surgery showing a normal uterine cavity. The woman became pregnant spontaneously three months later and gave birth to a healthy baby weighing 3.5 kilogram. This is a 33-year-old nulliparous woman with hypointense submucosal fibroid of six centimeters and hypermenorrhea. You can see the myoma occupying the whole uterine cavity here, type zero, type one, uh, with a high vascularization, this in the, on the right, and small areas here and here, small areas of low vascularization. Contrast enhanced image immediately after HIFU showed an unperfused volume of 100%. Six months later, the myoma completely disappeared with restoration of normal uterine anatomy. This patient achieved two full-term spontaneous pregnancies that ended in, an, in uncomplicated vaginal deliveries at 38 and, 30, uh, 38 and 37 weeks. Okay, a few words about adenomyosis. Uh, we know from different publications that adenomyosis is an important cause of infertility and that treatment is a great challenge for, for the gynecologist. Adenomyomectomy is very aggressive for the uterus and this type of surgery carries subsequent obstetric risks that we cannot ignore or, or surgical risks, um, okay? Se severe hemorrhage with subsequent emergency hysterectomy and when uh, the women uh, get pregnant, it's possible uh, the uterine rupture and some uh, risks like, like this. The results from this meta-analysis show that HIFO is effective for the treatment of adenomyosis, reducing the uterine volume at the 12 months, reducing this menorrhea at three and 12, and 12 months, and improving the quality of life at six and 12 months. Ad adverse reactions after HIFU were reported in 56% of patients, which were grade A or minor complications. There are still few studies on pregnancy outcome after HIFU treatment for adenomyosis, but the results are quite encouraging. In this study, 68 patients with adenomyosis who wish to get pregnancies were treated with HIFU ablation. 54 patients got pregnancy at the, at the median of 10 months after HIFU, and 21 of them had delivered healthy babies. No uterine rupture occurred during gestation or delivery. This menorrhea and menorrhagia in the patients who had pregnancies after HIFU were significantly, significantly relieved. In this other study from the last year, 93 Three, 93 patients with adenomyosis and infertility were included. 50 were treated with HIFO and 43 underwent 
laparoscopic excision. The most important conclusion of the study was that patients treated with HIFU showed significantly higher pregnancy rates and natural conception rates than those who underwent laparoscopic surgery. You can see here a pregnancy rate of 52% in the HIFU group versus 30% in the laparoscopic group, 40% of natural conception versus 80% in the laparoscopic group. In, and okay, uh, as a conclusion or message to, to, get ho to take home, uterine fibroids and adenomyosis can negatively affect fertility and increase the, the specific risk of, of specific pregnancy complications. And myomectomy and adenomyomectomy have some disadvantages that we, uh, we have considered, especially in women who have desired to conceive. According to our experience, ultrasound guide HIFU therapy is an effective and safe treatment for uterine fibroids. Ultrasound guide HIFU makes it possible to obtain full term pregnancies with few intrapartum or postpartum complications in patients with benign uterine pathology. And due to its non invasive nature, it should be the first therapeutic option in women with uterine fibroids and gestational desire with many disadvantages advantages over myomectomy. And of course, we need prospective random studies to, to confirm these observations. And okay, that's it. That's it. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. If you have some questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your beautiful presentation. Uh, we are very much appreciate your contribution. And You're maybe first question uh, from me. Uh, cesarean rate uh, in fibroid, uh, 43%. And uh, adenomyosis, uh, you showed the cesarean rate is 67%. Uh, why uh, there is a uh, some difference in cesarean rate in yeah. between fibroid and adenomyosis. Cesarean, sorry, the cesarean. Uh, cesarean rate uh, in, in case of fibroid, you showed 43%. In my, in my series, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And adenomyosis, uh, 67%. Uh, yeah, after HIFO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, after HIFO. Hybrid and uh, adenomyosis. There is some difference yeah. in cesarean rate. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, yeah, after uh, cesarean rate after uh, in adenomyosis after yeah. HIFO treatment is 67%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question to, uh, it's difficult to, to answer this question. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult, Pro probably because um, in, in, the, in the group of patients with adenomyosis, the, the incidence or, or the prevalence, the incidence of uh, sterility is very high. Mm -hmm. And it's probably these patients, when they, they achieved a pregnancy after mm -hmm. a pregnancy after in vitro fertilization, is a very um, it's a very uh, diff it's very it's very difficult to achieve pregnancy after after adenomyosis, uh, uh, and it, probably this group of patients wants to 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 have a very safe delivery, and probably for personal reasons, uh, these patients want to 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 have a Schindler cesarean section to to avoid some problems of the vaginal delivery, perhaps, I don't know. It, 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 this is a possible, uh, 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 possible reason, but it's, it's difficult to, to know why. Oh, thank you for your explanation. And uh, there is... Is there any question? Mm. 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 
そう。OK。うん、How many cycles?So, how many cycles of high treatment required for adrenomyosis?How about in interval between treatment? There is a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's uh, with one with one session of treatment is is enough to to have a good results in adenomyosis. Um, yeah, only one time. Yeah, only one time. But um, and you can repeat this treatment uh, one, two, three years after after the first treatment if the if the adenomyosis. Uh, Uh, um, uh, re recruitment, re recruitment is okay. Appear is appear uh, newly, um, but for the first time we can treat uh, in one session the whole adenomyosis. Yeah, and okay, we we can and the, and the patient can can got pregnant. Uh, three six months uh, mm, uh, after treatment um, with no problems. Yeah, I I cannot demonstrate this because we don't have studies. Okay. But probably if we if we if we uh, wait three months six months uh, is enough to to uh, to to get to get pregnant. Maybe. Yes, maybe I can read. Maybe can... for adenomyosis, do you use GnRH? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We use three months of uh, GnRH analogs uh, before treatment. Treatment. Yeah. Okay. In all cases. Okay. So thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. We enjoyed your talk. Next, to maybe. Uh, Sharing by Dr. Angela. Okay, thank you, yeah. uh, Professor Tsumi. I would like to uh, introduce our last speaker, certainly not the least, to, to present a video on uh, high food treatment of adenomyosis and myoma. Uh, he is Dr. Wei Chun Chen, a visiting staff of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the Gynecologic Oncologist Group of the Chang Gong Memorial Hospital in Taoyuan. He's a member of the Taiwan Association of Obstetric and Gynecology and an associate member of the Taiwan Association of Gynecologic Oncology. He's in fact a director and member of the Taiwan Society of the Gynecologic High Food Treatment and a member of the Taiwan Society for Peritoneal Surface Malignancy. His research interests are, of course, gynecologic oncology, surgical oncology, as well as chemotherapy. But his focus and he will talk about it, is high-intensity focused ultrasound in gynecologic benign tumor. So I'd like to yield the floor to Professor Dr. Wei Chun Chen. Dr. Chen, please. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Prof. Dr. So, Chen, uh, you can. In a short video, can, can everyone see? Yeah, okay. we can see you, but you're on presenter view. So maybe you can just share part of your slide. OK, OK. Okay. Okay, correct. Go ahead. Okay, hello. Good evening. I'm Dr. from Chang'e Memorial Hospital of Lincoln. My name is Wei Jun Chen. 
Uh, thanks to FH giving me a chance to have a talk here tonight. My speech is the high food treatment of real myoma and abnormalities. I will also show the video demo. And this is the outline of my speech. And the high food is high intensity focused ultrasound. It's a non-invasive treatment for real myoma. High food utilizes the physical characteristics of the ultrasonic wave, such as tissue penetration and the focus ability. It can penetrate the abnormal wall and focus the tumor inside body. So the energy produced in focused area can destroy the tissue by coagulation necrosis. So this is a swine liver transition view. We can see high food at an acoustic channel and the focus at the internal target to make the focus size turn to white color as coagulation necrosis without damage to surrounding normal tissue. So high food can make the swine liver to coagulation necrosis during high food ablation. From growth view of tissue transition, the treated area turned to white. Besides under real time ultrasound during high food, the coagulation necrosis area also turned to a bright sign. We call it grayscale change. High food can make cavitation reaction in the treated tissue. Cavitation can make a bubble oscillation reaction in tissue when the energy accumulation to a threshold limit. Bubble is closed and then occurred and make the local tissue coagulation necrosis. The post NRI view can also see the necrosis part turn to non perfusion area. The coagulation necrosis can make the local cell necrosis in acute phase and the delayed phase due to vascular discharge. Local cell apoptosis will also occur, and the dead cell debris was then cleared by the immune cell that lead to tumor reduction. And our Haifu Center, Chang'e Memorial Hospital, Taoyuan Haifu Center, located in northern Taiwan. So this is uh, our Haifu Center start since 2015. We are one of the earliest hospitals to involve high food as a treatment of myoma and adenomyosis. Last year, last year we had treated once 130 cases. We, the machine of high food we applied is Chongqing high food machines. So in our center, a standard high food machine with a meeting room and then observation room can make a good high food treatment as well as high food teaching and the training in our center. Here I will show you the size reduction rate in our center. We had calculated the data during 2015 to 2017. Since time limit issue, I will only add this basic treatment data here. There were 139 myomas and 124 adenomyosis in the three year data. The median myoma size was 8.4 centimeter and the adenomyosis was 7.9 centimeter. The high food treatment duration was around 87 to 106 minutes. The sonication time was 923 and 744 seconds. Here is the size reduction rate by different estimation timing. The non perfusion area ratio after high food by NRI was 90 to 100%. The three month size reduction rates was around 50%. 12 months size reduction rates was around 60%. We can see even 48 months, the four year size reduction rate can be measured as 70%. So I would like to show video demo of Lyle Myoma case here. This 33, 32 years old lady had no pregnancy history, no operation or disease history. She had myoma diagnosed at least three years. She usually had dysmenorrhea, voiding frequent symptoms. The pre high food lab data showed normal range of CA125 and LDH. That suggests the myoma was favorable uh, benign lesion. So from the pre high food NRI, we can see in T2 weighted image, the myoma was hypo intensity. 
That means the myeloma may be hypervascularity and the energy can be left for a long time inside. So the myeloma and the myeloma was at anterior wall and the size is seven centimeter. From T1, contrast enhanced image. The lesion was hypo intensity based on T1 enhanced and T2 weight image. We can predict it may have good response to high food for such myeloma. The future of myeloma operation. Since myeloma has a capsule, the energy can be limited by this capsule and the accumulation. The intensity inside myeloma, the accumulation energy can then make the general aberration. That usually use the concentrated high dose energy strategy for the myeloma aberration. So we can see here is the ACL view of myeloma. When we treat, use high food to treat the myeloma, we usually use the ACL view of myeloma and the, the ACL view can separate to several five millimeter faces. Then, we weak then to abrasion. We firstly choose the central largest space under the high full treat view. Under the high full treated view, we can image the myeloma as a full quantum view and choose the deep and the full side as the initial treated point to give energy, the yellow point. And after treating the yellow point, we can give high dose energy to the neighbor point, the brown point. That is the central phase. And after the central phase treatment, then we choose the neighbor phase to high dose energy treatment. We also treat the deep and the full side, the yellow point, then to the brown point. Then go on another side, neighbor to the central phase to high dose energy treatment. We also treat the deep, deep, deep and the full side, firstly, the yellow point, and then the brown point. So usually after energy focus on central three phases, there is a great scale change as coagulation necrosis can be seen via real ultrasound, real time ultrasound. The coagulation necrosis area can even larger than the treatment core since the energy can extend about one centimeter from the focus target. So after concentrated energy given, then start to put energy to other untreated area by phase. We notice the most lateral two phases should be omitted since the energy can extend one centimeter from the focus target. So we need to omit the lateral two phases to avoid energy exposure to outside organ. Here the reinforcement treatment was along the deep arc lining of the myoma edge with the same dose of energy given. So here I show the video demo of the myeloma hybridization. First, we check the first treated point in the largest central phase. We then use the balloon, like the picture, to put the balloon between hypoprobe and abdominal wall. It can make the focus inside the tumor. So besides, the balloon can also make compression to push away the bulb from the high frequency channel. So, so after balloon set up, we then establish, establish the treated phases. Then we use concentrated energy strategy to put the high dose energy to the central largest three phase firstly. Like we just say, we choose the central large, large phase, phase and then we started to treat the deep and the full side of the myoma. 
and the first treat the the yellow point and the, to the other brown point. After the central phase, we treat the neighbor phase. Like we just said, we also treat the deep and the full side. Firstly. So during our treatment, we can compare the picture. The left side is the pre high full view and the right side is under high full treatment view. And we can compare the two view and we can see there is obvious gray scale change of myoma. The myoma getting much, much bright than treatment, than, than untreated phase. So we, sometimes we need to take the rest of, of the skin. So we can see there is cluster, gray scale change can be seen during high full ablation. That is a coagulation necrosis sign of ultrasound finding. And uh, we usually make a storage of the picture during treatment. So after cluster gray scale change was found, focus energy along the cluster area to expand the cluster change. So the, after the, the central three phase treatment, we started to put the energy to the other untreated phases to make the energy reinforcement. Also the treated point was along the arc lining of the myoma edge. Yeah. So during treatment, we need to notice the, the, the edge of the myoma and is there any other soft tissue between the skin and the uterus. We need to avoid to, to, to the focus, to prevent the focus outside the uterus. And then, When we treat the left lateral side, we need to make sure the left side limit and to see if the left side is completely treated. So after the left side treated, we turn to the right side myoma treatment. The same, the same as previous treated. We need to make the treaty point along the arc lining of the myoma. And uh, once every time we start to check the treat the face, we need to measure how the distance between the focus to the myoma edge. Okay. So after the left side and the right side treatment, we can see the obvious gray scale change you know, in the myoma. Then we remove the water balloon and make sure the internal gray scale change to see is there any other part of myoma still not treated. Also, we use the doper to make sure is there any internal buffer inside the myoma. If there is still buffer inside the myoma, we need to make the reinforcement of the energy. Of course, many countries use the contrast medium to confirm is there any buffer inside? But because in Taiwan, there is no legal contrast medium indicated for gynecology tumor. So in Taiwan, we still use only very simple the 
local ultrasound to make sure it's there is is there is no flow inside the myoma. So we can see this myoma has full of grayscale change without the internal bravo. The bravo only at the at the surrounding area. That's okay. So the cluster grayscale change found at 385 seconds of sonication. And the treatment finished at 850 seconds of sonication. No central flow after high flow. The total treatment was 112 minutes. High flow average power was 400 water with total energy was 339,700 joules. So this is the immediate NRI after high food. Both T2 and the T1 enhanced image showed mass as 7.2 centimeter without, with no in reduction, with central non perfuse area ratio about 100%. So we can compare the, this patient's pre high food and the post high food NRI. We can see the central coagulation across area with no counter flow into that area. So after one month follow up, the myoma shrink to 5.8 centimeter, the volume reduction rate about 45%. And after further three months follow up, the myoma shrink to 4.7 centimeter, the volume reduction rate about 70%. Then here we introduce a very classic adenomyosis treatment video demo. This 42 years old lady had one cesarean section history. She had no chronic medical disease, but ever received a blotomy in 2013. And her adenomyosis had been found for four years and it makes her hypermenorrhea with dysmenorrhea. She had tried Visang and Gestion before, but both were not satisfied. She had elevated CA125 as 96.3. So this is her pre high food NRI. She had posterior adenomyosis size as 5.2 centimeter to 60.1. So this is her T2 image of NRI. We can see the myoma was a posterior agency adenomyosis size is 4.8 to 7.7 centimeter. Her T1 weighted image showed hypo intensity. So it can predict her adenomyosis may, may have good response to high food. So the high food feature of adenomyosis. Traditionally, adenomyosis can be classified as intrinsic or extrinsic by the junction layer near endometrium or serosa. And this is the intrinsic type. First is the intrinsic type adenomyosis. The adenomyosis part is near endometrium. And the extrinsic type adenomyosis in the figure two, the adenomyosis part is near serosa. So since adenomyosis has no capsule like myoma, so it may be easy to spread to area outside adenomyosis. So when we perform high food, we need to, to be careful of endometrium and the serosa lining during treatment. Usually the intrinsic type was easy to, the, the energy when we treat the intrinsic type was easy to endometrium and the extrinsic type was easy to serosa. So when we perform high food for adenomyosis, unlike myoma, we need to use average low dose energy strategy and the individual 
reinforcement of energy after general energy application. So we also start the axial view of analysis. Also, axial view of analysis can be separate to several five millimeter phase. When we used to perform hyper, we also choose the central largest phase. So we need to, we can see the hyper treated view. Yeah, when we perform hypo for endomyosis, we need to confirm the endometrium and the serosal lining. Well, after we confirm the endometrium and the, and the serosal lining, we also choose the deep and full site as the initial treated point, the yellow point. Then after the yellow point, we, we put the energy on the brown point. So the same as myoma, we after central phase treatment, we choose the neighbor phase to treat. Also treat the deep and the full side firstly, yeah. Then go on another side, neighbor to central phase. Also treat the deep and the full side firstly, then to the other neighbor point. So like myoma, then after treat the central three phases, we then started to put energy to other area face by face. Uh, also, we, we must notice the most lateral two phases should be omitted to avoid energy exposure to outside organ. So in other phase, we use the low dose energy to put it to put to loss, loss po point along the deep arc lining of the mass edge. So after put the every phase, every every treated phase, then we perform a Doppler ultrasound to see if there is still any other far flow inside the adenomyosis. If still flow inside the adenomyosis, we can make individual reinforcement of energy to treat the, the loss internal flow. So here is the video demo of adenomyosis. Yeah, when we treat the adenomyosis, we can compare the NRI and we need to measure the distance to skin to check the endometrium and the cellulose analysis. Then we use Doppler to check pre hypo bar flow of adenomyosis. So we can see there is many soft tissue like ball between the uterus and the abdominal wall. So we also put the balloon to make compression. The balloon compression can push ball away from the acoustic channel and then make our focus inside adenomyosis. Yeah. So after compression, we can push, push the bow away of the acoustic channel. Then we started to treat the adenomyosis. Also, we use average low dose energy strategy. We choose central three phases to give energy firstly. Yeah. So this is the central phase. Yeah. We also treat treat the deep and full side. And the, after the central phase, we go to the neighbor phase to treat. So during treatment, we can see the, the gray scale change can already be seen. But we also notice there's some bright, bright, bright tissue between the uterus and the abdominal wall. So, when we treat it, we need to check if, if this is a, only a bladder reflex or some bowel involvement in our acoustic channel. So this is under the central phase treatment. Then after central phase treatment, we started to put energy to other untreated area. 
this patient was started to treat, make treatment from the right side. Also, we make the treat point along the arc lining of the adenomyosis edge. So this is still under treatment. So once we treat every phase, we need to confirm if, if, if this space is near the, the, the edge of adenomyosis. So we need to confirm the right side limit to confirm if the right side already finished treatment. Now after right side treatment, we go to another side, left side, to put energy on the left side. So this is the left side. We can see there is great scale change compared with the pre hypo view. Yeah. So we, this view is confirmed the left side limit to check if the left side of adenomyosis has already been treated. Yeah. Now we can see, compared with the pre hypo view, the general grade scale change can be seen. So after the left side and the right side treatment, we then remove the balloon to see if there is general grade scale change inside the adenomyosis. So compared with the untreated view, we can see general grayscale change can be seen after high food. Then we use Doppler ultrasound to see if there is still any blood flow inside the treated area. If there is still blood flow inside the adenomyosis, we need to make low dose energy reinforcement. So this patient, after high food, had caused a great scale change since 492 seconds. We finished our high food treatment at 520 seconds. Her post high food MRI showed in, of T2 and T1 enhanced image showed the adenomyosis size was <coughs> 5 to 6.1 centimeter. The maroon reduction rate about 33%. The non perfusion area ratio is 97%. Yeah. This is her compared to the pre hypo and the post hypo NRI. So we can see the hypo, the after hypo, the non perfusion area can be produced. but the energy was very close to the endometrium. So when we treat the adenomyosis, we also need to confirm if the patient had any pregnancy demand and control the, the treated the, the, the energy of the dose we give to the adenomyosis. So after the high food, the, this patient Total treatment duration was 125 minutes. The sonication time was 520 seconds. Yeah. After high food, we use we we give the GnRH and Dynodrest for the for post high food treatment. So this this is the post follow post high food follow up view. So after two months of follow-up, 
the ultrasound showed the abnormalities size shrink to 3.6 to 4.5 centimeter with the size reduction rate about 75%. So the summary of my surgical video talk is HIFU use the characteristic of ultrasound to penetrate tissue and the high intensity ultrasound can treat internal mass without injury to skin or uterine surface. So it can achieve the real non-invasive surgery. And for the myoma treatment of HIFU, we we usually use concentrated high dose energy strategy to, to treat the central three large base to produce the core of the coagulation of necrosis. And then after the core, the, the core of coagulation necrosis was produced, we can put energy along the, along the core to make the core occupy the whole myoma. For adenomyosis of hyper treatment, we should protect the endometrium with a safe margin. So we consider average low dose energy strategy to put the low dose energy to hold the whole adenomyosis. And then after put the whole adenomyosis, we can use Doppler ultrasound to see if there is still any residual blood flow inside the dermis. Then if there is still flow, we can make individual reinforcement of energy to those residual flow site. So thanks for attention. Yeah, thanks for FH to give me a chance to have talk here. Uh, if any question, welcome to email me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, very interesting and engaging talk. We have a lot of questions in the chat box. Apparently, your talk has generated a lot of interest in our audience. So I'd like to read the question. We have time to have a Q&A. So the first is from Dr. Olaric. The adenomyosis, for adenomyosis, do you use medications such as GnRH agonist or Deinogest? plus HIFU, I think it was in one of your slides. Dr. Chen, kindly answer. Yeah, I usually use, I, I, I use GRH atonis of the sun after HIFU, after HIFU. Because like, like just Professor Sun said, yeah, after HIFU treatment, we still cannot confirm is there the, the Every adenomyosis cell can be treated by HIFU. So I usually use GNRH after HIFU to, 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 give, to the, give the possible residual adenomyosis cell treatment. And the, Bisang, and the Dinogest I also use for a maintenance treatment. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. thank you. So from Dr. Matepan, in the treatment cycle for adenomyosis, I suppose that's a high food treatment. Is it necessary that you should avoid treatment during the menstrual phase? Okay. Oh, and sometimes because I sometimes the patients may 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 have prolonged menstruation or prolonged spotting due to adenomyosis, so it may. It is hard to prevent high food performed not in breathing breathing time. So if so we usually we we usually said we need to we, we can perform high food during menstruation, but we need to avoid the, the most largest amount stay. Yeah. If Maybe. the the if the menstruation is a little bit, that is okay. Okay, maybe at the end of the menstrual cycle, right? So uh, another from Dr. Ala Wise, can we treat a huge myoma, meaning larger than 12 by 12 centimeter? So do we have limits, Dr. Chen, for the size? Yeah, I, the size is not an issue because I will check if the 
the, the huge myeloma is over umbilicus. I usually, uh, we, the high food usually need to avoid the acoustic channel to pass away the umbilicus because the umbilicus is easy to have burn, burn, burn injury. So if the myeloma is over the umbilicus, then we, we, we may need a, we need, we need some medication like, like GNRG to make the myeloma sh and shrink okay. below the umbilicus, then we can treat it. So the, the size is not, is not really an issue. Okay. Of course, of course, there is some paper said when myoma over ten centimeter, it may have much more risk uh, to a uh, like bowel injury or nerve injury or or tumor lysis syndrome during during ablation. But in our center, we 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 have not made made such such problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is from. Uh... Professor Tsumi Osama, your hospital is very famous. I think that's Janggung for laparoscopic surgery. Is there any guideline for indication between laparoscopic myomectomy or HIFU? I mean, how do you choose the cases? Which one goes to HIFU and which one goes to laparoscopy? Dr. Chen. Yeah, and because the HIFU is, has, has very high cost in Taiwan. So, so uh, if people, we usually, sometimes we need to see if the patient's insurance, uh, if the patient can afford high food. And I will, I, I will give, oh, give, oh, I give my choice. Depend on the patient, maybe. It depends on the patients, depend on the patient. Patient, choose choice of the patient. Maybe. Yeah, if patient want high food, I will, mm -hmm. I will see, I see is there any, mm -hmm. yeah, is any contraindication to okay. these patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Another, so your talk is very uh, engaging for our audience from Dr. Eileen about uh, for adenomyosis. Maybe you should confirm because of the uniqueness of the disease. We usually use three steps. I think this is a commentary. You first use HIFU, the GNRH, or the Inogest. The third, and maybe the third option is TCRE plus Mirena. So that may be just a, um, just a commentary. Here's one question from the Philippines from my colleague, Dr. Karin Reforma. What's the recurrence rate of adenomyosis myoma after HIFU treatment? Dr. Chen, please. Okay. Uh... For our is uh, a for our experience, we can a uh, we can see a uh, the hyper treatment the recur uh, if the recurrence means the mass get re enlarged after hypo. Yeah, we can see there usually there uh, almost about ten percent ten percent recurrence rate after hypo. Of course. In this recurrent, in this patient with recurrence, we can see their mass sometimes is much bigger, is, is much bigger than other without recurrence. So, so we 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 still need to uh, when we choose patient for high food, we still need to if the patient if if the mass is much is much bigger or if the mass is has much more buffer, and we need to use some medication before high food to make the mass shrink or and the vascular and shrink, and then we treat the high food, and we use the high food to treat. That may make much more a um, good response, better response. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Chen. I guess that was the last question. Uh, congratulations for your talk, and I will turn over the floor to our chairman, Dr. Tsutsumi Osamu, for the closing remarks. Dr. Professor Osamu. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Uh, before closing, I would like to thank all the speakers and participants for joining the wonderful, fruitful uh, international meeting. I hope 
this meeting make a milestone for dissemination of haifu all over the world. And finally, uh, I am going to remind you uh, third episode. Uh, will you please uh, keep the date? Okay. So thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.